Hi Nick, I'm making this video because I love you very much. The thesis of this video is that I love you very much. The content of this video is going to be some quotes from Joseph Campbell that I've been thinking about recently. When we were talking in the car yesterday, I mentioned that you were reminding me of the story of Muhammad. I want to read you a little bit of that story as Joseph Campbell writes it, so I'm going to read that now. The accepted Muslim legend tells that this revelation came to Muhammad in a cave on the side of Mount Hira, three miles north of Mecca, to which he used to retire for peaceful contemplation, often alone, but sometimes with Khadijah, his wife. As we read in one retelling, he was there pondering the mystery of man of corruptible flesh when a dazzling vision of beauty and light overpowered his soul and senses, and he heard the word proclaim, proclaim. He was confused and terrified, but the cry rang clear three times, proclaim, proclaim, proclaim until the first overpowering confusion yielded to a collected realization of his mission. Its author was God, its subject, man, God's creature, and its instrument, the pen, the sanctified book which men were to read, study, recite, and treasure in their souls. So, there's a cave above Mecca I'm going to put a picture of the cave over this audio. There's this cave above the city of Mecca that Muhammad made a habit of climbing to, and he would spend the night there in contemplation. You can still visit this cave. The only pictures I can find on the internet are of people, tourists, visiting this cave. And in this cave, Muhammad received visions and those visions changed the course of human history. They changed the world in a violent, dramatic, undeniable, extreme, powerful way. What, a third of the world's people are Muslim? A fifth? Some, some ridiculous quantity? Two billion people are Muslim? states and cultures and all of this can be tied back to the ecstatic experiences of one man who lived in historical time, 622 AD. We know his biography, even if it is mythologized. When I think about that story, I think about that experience, what would it have been like to feel so compelled to climb up the mountains and spend a night in a cave? And what would it have been like to, to feel a voice commanding you, proclaim Proclaim, proclaim. I don't really care about the ontology of that voice, whether it's natural or supernatural. I think it's natural, but I don't really care. I don't really think that's the point. The point is to ask, what would it be like to be Muhammad? To have the experience of that voice so intensely felt in your body? And that makes me think about you. I think that there exists a certain kind of mind, a certain kind of human that is uniquely sensitive to a certain way of being, and that it's a way of being that for the vast majority of human history was recognized and respected by societies as a vital as a vital part of any society societies need prophets or perhaps if we go back even earlier societies need shamans and i want to say a little bit more about this idea of a prophet or a shaman or any of the other names for this kind of human that we have over the course of human phylogeny. But before I say more, I want to read you a little bit about some shamans, particularly the biography of a shaman named Ujukaruk. This is also from Joseph Campbell. Here it goes. In his youth, 
Strange unknown beings came to Ijukaruk and spoke to him, and when he awoke, he saw all the visions of his dream so distinctly that he could tell his fellows all about them. Soon it became evident that he was destined to become an Anakagok, a shaman, and, the old, and an old man named Perquanok was appointed his instructor. In the depth of winter, when the cold was most severe, Ijukaruk was placed on a small sledge just large enough for him to sit on, and carried far away from his home to the other side of Hikolujuag. On reaching the appointed spot, he remained seated on the sledge while his instructor built a tiny snow hut, with barely room for him to sit cross-legged. He was not allowed to set foot on the snow, but was lifted from the sledge and carried into the hut where a piece of skin just large enough for him to sit on was served as a carpet. No food or drink was given him. He was exhorted to think only of the great spirit and of the helping spirit that should presently appear, and so he was left to himself and his meditations. After five days had elapsed, the instructor brought him a drink of lukewarm water, and with similar exhortations left him alone as before. He fasted now for fifteen days, and when he was given another drink of water and a very small piece of meat, which was to last him another ten days. At the end of this period, his instructor came for him and fetched him home. Ijugruk declared that the strain of those thirty days of cold and fasting were so severe that he sometimes died a little. During all that time he thought only of the great spirit and endeavored to keep his mind free from all memory of human beings and everyday things. Towards the end of the thirty days there came to him a helping spirit in the shape of a woman. She came while he was asleep and seemed to hover in the air above him. After that he dreamed no more of her, but she became his helping spirit. For five months following this period of trial he was kept on the strictest diet and required to abstain from all intercourse with women. The fasting was then repeated, for such fasts at frequent intervals are the best means of attaining knowledge of hidden things. And as a matter of fact, there is no limit of the period of study. It depends on how much one is willing to suffer and anxious to learn. Campbell goes on to say that perhaps the best summation of the ultimate import of these myths and rites for the courageous men and women whose very difficult lives they served is expressed in the sentiment, reported by Dr. Rasmussen, of our little old friend Najakanek of North Alaska. This word Silam, or Silam Inua, the inhabitant or soul, Inua, of the universe, is never seen. Its voice alone is heard. All we know is that it has a gentle voice like a woman, a voice so fine and gentle that even children cannot become afraid. What it says is, Sila ersinar sinvindulej. Sila ersinar sinvindulej. Do be not afraid of the universe. Sila ersinar sinvindulej. Be not afraid of the universe. There is a power that we call Sila, Nyakonek says, one that cannot be explained in so many words. A strong spirit, the upholder of the universe, of the weather, in fact, all life on earth, so mighty that his speech to man comes not through ordinary words, but through storms, snowfall, rain showers, the tempests of the sea, through all the forces that man fears, or through sunshine, calm seas, or small, innocent playing children who understand nothing. When times are good, Sila has nothing to say to mankind. He has disappeared into his infinite nothingness and remains away as long as people do not abuse life but have respect for their daily food. No one has ever seen Sila. His place of sojourn is so mysterious that he is with us and infinitely far away at the same time. He is with us and infinitely far away at the same time. So, Nick, I think that humans are very diverse, and we live in a society that's filled with specialists and people who are uniquely skilled at particular things like hedge fund management or capoeira dancing. And I think that some humans are uniquely suited to perceiving that mysterious thing which is both with us 
and infinitely far away at the same time, and it's a thing that we give many names. Nyakonik called it Sila. And I feel an intense kind of nostalgia for a time in human history where those sensitivities were honored and given a valued place in society instead of being pathologized. This is a dangerous line of thought to go down. You know, I've met many people who claim to be shamans, many, you know, white American people who claim to be shamans or who want to learn shamanistic practices. And there's a very slippery slope of of cultural appropriation and 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 all the things associated with that. But the point that I want to make to you by reading these stories about the shamans of the north or reading you this story of Muhammad is that these experiences are real and they're powerful and they have shaped history and they're important. I want there to be a space for them in the world that I live in. And I value you and I value your friendship because, because of so many things. You know, I value your your intensity and your reliability and you know, really if I had to if I had to sum it all up, you know, the, the, the reason why I care so much about you is that that you have a, a way of experiencing reality that I believe needs to be shared and I want to help you share it. Yeah, I don't really know what that would look like and you know if these shamanistic stories tell us anything is that this experience of reality is deeply deeply painful. It's like death. It's an experience of dying and being reborn. And yeah, I I'm going to be silent with you for a moment until I gather my thoughts up again. I'm going to be silent for about 30 seconds or a minute. I'm going to stare at the camera. I hope you stare too. So, I don't know much about what you're experiencing, but I have a feeling that it might be something like what Muhammad experienced, or what Ijukaruk experienced, and I want you to know how much I honor and respect that experience, despite the profound pain and emotional disruption and physical disruption that it causes in your life. I think you're really brave and I think you're doing something impossibly difficult and I want you to know that I care a lot about you and I think that this way of being is important. 
it's a way of being that I also want to be sometimes. So I guess that's all. I recorded dedicated videos with more about Northern Shamans written by Joseph Campbell and also a fuller version of Muhammad's biography there next to this video on this channel, Infinity Every Day. Yeah, I think I'd like to end this video by singing you a prayer. It's called the Shivananda Arati. I sang it to you before. Um, and uh, I'm gonna sing it to you again. It's a prayer to the God of many names, maybe Sila, maybe Allah, maybe awareness. It goes like this. Jaya Jaya Rati Vina Vinayaka Vina Vinayaka Shri Ganesha Jaya Jaya Rati Subramanya Subramanya Kartikeya Jaya Jaya Rati Venugopala Venugopala Venuola Papa Vidura Navanita Chora Jaya Jaya Rati Venkanta Ramana Venkanta Ramana Sankata Harana Sita Rama Radhe Shama Jaya Jaya Rati Gauri Manohara Gauri Manohara Bhavani Sankara Samba Sada Shiva Uma Maheshwara Jaya Jaya Rati Raja Rajeshwari Raja Rajeshwari Tripura Sundari Mahalakshmi Mahasaraswati Mahakali Mahashakti Jaya Jaya Rati Anjaneya Anjaneya Hanumanta Jaya Jaya Rati Data Treya Data Treya Trimuturi Avatara Jaya Jaya Rati Adityaya Adityaya Bhaskaraya Jaya Jaya Rati Sanischaraya Sanischaraya Bhaskaraya Jaya Jaya Rati Sankarachaya Sankarachaya Advaita Gurave Jaya Jaya Rati Sadguru Nata Sadguru Nata Shivananda Jaya Jaya Rati Vishnu Devananda Vishnu Devananda, Vishnu Devananda, Jaya Jaya Rati Agastya Munaye, Agastya Munaye, Sri Rama Priyaye, Jaya Jaya Rati Ayapa Swamine, Ayapa Swamine Dharma Shastave, Jaya Jaya Rati Jesus Gurave, Moses Gurave, Buddha Gurave, Jaya Jaya Rati Muhammad Gurave, Guru Nanak Gurave, Samastya Guru Pho Namaha, Jaya Jaya Rati Venu Gopala. Om Natatra Suyobati Nachandra Taratam Nema Vidyobanti Kutoya Magni Tuameva Bantamalubanti Sarvam Tasya Basya Sarvamidam Vivanti Om Gange Kayamune Kaiva Govari Saraswati Narmade Sidukarveri Namastutam Namo Namaha Twame Vamata Chapita Twame Va Twame Va Bandu Shasaka Twame Va Twame Va Vidya Dravinam Twame Va 
Twame Vasarvam Mama Deva Deva Kayena Vacha Manasendriarva Budyat Manava Prakrite Sabavad Karo Miadyad Sakalam Parasmahe Narayana Yiti Sarmar Payami Twameva Mata Chapita Twameva Twameva Bandusha Saka Twameva Twameva Vidya Dravinam Twameva Twameva Sarvam Mama Deva Deva Kaye Navacha Manasendriarva Budyat Manava Prakrite Sabava Karo Miadyad Sakalam Parasmahe Narayana Yiti Sarmar Payami A rough translation is, O God of Gods, you are my mother, father, sister, daughter, lover, friend, everything. Whatever actions I perform with my body, mind, senses, emotion, intellect, all these, all these, I dedicate you. You. Sarva dharmam pravichaya mam kayam sovereignam vrija aham sva sarva papayo moksha yamima sucha. I love you very much, Nick. I'll talk to you soon.